Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, first talk in the series of Christmas lectures from the College of Science at the University of Lincoln. My name's uh, Dr. Matthew Booth and I'm going to talk about uh, Santa Claus. So I'm a physicist and today I'm going to try and explain uh, Santa Claus uh, using quantum physics. Uh, but more accurately, maybe what I'm going to do is uh, try and explain uh, quantum physics using Santa Claus. So there's a few questions I'm going to try and answer in this talk. So you see this picture, I hope you can see my cursor, but you can see this picture here of Santa Claus. And um, the first question to really uh, address is what does quantum mean? Where does this word quantum come from? I'll talk a bit about how Santa fits down the chimneys. So we know Santa likes his mince pie, so how does he fit down the chimney? And I'll finish by talking about how Santa makes his list of who is naughty and who is nice. So there are the three questions I would like to answer today. And so let's start with the first one. So what does quantum mean? So maybe you have heard the word quantum before. I imagine you have uh, maybe outside of physics. So there's some famous films, for example, uh, James Bond, there's a film called Quantum of Solace. And there's an old TV show, which I was, uh, too young to watch uh, called Quantum Leap. And maybe you've heard of quantum Duracell uh, batteries. Um, so this word quantum finds uses outside of physics, it's actually from Latin. Uh, there's a word uh, quanta in Latin, which just means an amount. And that's a bit of a clue as to what quantum means in the context of physics. But it also means kind of a big step. Uh, so here, the Duracell quantum battery was supposed to be kind of a big leap forwards in the uh, battery technology. So this is what quantum means uh, in general. And there's a nice article you can go and read uh, from the Columbia Journalism uh, Review. The link's down here uh, underneath if you can read this. Uh, so it's a bit of history about the, the word quantum. Um, but we're talking about a particular uh, meaning of quantum, uh, specifically in the context of physics. So. Um, to start our kind of story, but since it's Christmas, uh, let's kind of look at this nice cozy picture of a, a fire as a Christmas tree. If we uh, go and look closely at the fire, and not too closely, uh, we see that uh, the embers, there's lots of different colours in the embers. And the reason for this is that different parts of the fire are different colours. So we can see some yellow bits, there's some orange bits. If you look carefully at the top here, there's a bit of blue there. And the different colours we see in this picture of the fire mean that the uh, that area is a different colour, is a different temperature. Sorry. So um, this is uh, something called black body radiation. So this is the radiation that an object emits uh, and it depends on its uh, temperature. And we see some graphs here. So on the horizontal axis here, we have a wavelength. So you see this small region here is the visible spectrum between around uh, 400 nanometers and about 750 nanometers. The visible spectrum, you can see the rainbow here. And to the left of that is UV, and to the right of that is infrared. So this black solid line here is the prediction of classical physics. So this is the kind of physics um, in the 19th, uh, well, 18th, uh, start of the 19th century, um, before quantum physics. And this theory predicts this line here. So this is, uh, wavelength and the vertical axis, sorry, is the intensity of light. So we see uh, the kind of peak changes for different temperatures. So this peak down here, so these are the experimental results. This red peak, this is for 3000 Kelvin, so that's very hot. And we see this kind of red light. So most of the emission is in the infrared. If we increase the temperature of the object to around 4000 Kelvin, which is even hotter, we see it moves. The peak moves to the left, so that's getting more green. And if we increase the temperature even further to around 5,000 Kelvin, then the wavelength shifts even more to the left. So this looks blue. So this, the, the point I'm making here is that this classical theory uh, does not match the actual observed data very well at all. And this was called the UV catastrophe. UV catastrophe, sorry. And it was seen as a failure of classical physics. And uh, around the turn of the 20th century, this was kind of solved by uh, Max Planck. So that's this person here, uh, doesn't look very happy. Um, but he did solve this problem 
by uh, thinking about uh, energy or light as being composed of small packets of energy. So these small packets of energy, discrete uh, quantities of energy, are what we know as quanta in modern physics. So Planck actually uh, came up with uh, some uh, equation, which we now know as Planck's law, which really closely reproduced these experimental curves uh, using uh, theory. Okay, so rather than this classical theory, which doesn't match at all, it goes up to infinity, which is uh, not very good. Uh, Planck's law does actually really uh, closely match the data. Okay, so uh, you, you may be recognized Einstein this picture, so I don't know what they're doing at this table, maybe waiting for dinner or something. But uh, when Einstein heard of this idea of Planck's uh, to think about light as uh, uh, composed of small packets of energy, he said, good idea. And he applied it to a different problem uh, that was also confusing physicists at the time. So this was around the turn of the 20th century. And it's something called the photoelectric effect. Now, this couldn't be understood using classical physics, where we treat light as waves. Um, but Einstein uh, did manage to explain this phenomenon using this um, uh, quantum physics. So what's going on here is a bit of a complicated picture, but we have uh, some lights coming from, say, a, a lamp up here. The lights is this parallel rays coming down here, and it hits this metal plate labeled U. Um, and in some circumstances, this interaction of this light hitting this metal plate can cause electrons to be ejected from this metal plate in this direction, and they then uh, travel towards this other metal plate here, labeled E, and complete the circuit. And uh, under some circumstances, that completes the circuit, and we get a flow of current, and this light bulb uh, will turn on. So let's look what happens uh, when we uh, try different kinds of lights. So if we choose a red light, then nothing happens, even if we increase the intensity. Okay, and maybe we'll try a different color. And so we're gonna try uh, yellow. So even with the yellow light, we don't see the light bulb turn on, uh, regardless of the intensity. Uh, how about green light? Well, uh, as you maybe guessed, even if we turn the intensity right up, we don't see any uh, current flow. But when we get to a certain wavelength of light, a certain color of light, we see the light bulb turn on. Okay, so it doesn't seem to depend on intensity. Okay, the intensity of the, of the light that we shine down onto this metal plate doesn't matter. If we want this um, effect to happen where the light causes electrons from the metal to kind of jump across this gap, we need uh, a certain color. So it's the color that's important, not the uh, intensity. So this uh, experiment was performed by Millikan uh, quite famously. Um, so what we have here is the actual original data from Millikan. Uh, so here on these two columns, we have two different ways of thinking about the uh, energy of the light. So we can talk about light in terms of its wavelength or its frequency, and they're inversely proportional. The C here is the speed of light. And this stopping voltage uh, is quite difficult to explain, so don't worry too much about what the stopping voltage means. Uh, basically, the important thing is, if we kind of plot this data and, and project a line down onto the uh, x-axis, we see here a kind of threshold frequency below which we don't see any uh, effect. The effect starts at some threshold frequency. In this case, it's around 0.5 petahertz. So peta is times 10 to the 15, which is very large. And this corresponds to green light. So for this metal that was used for this data, which I believe was lithium, uh, you need to shine a certain color of light onto the metal plate in order for this effect to actually occur. And by the way, this gradient of this line is the same for all metals. It's, it's uh, some fundamental constant called Planck's constant, which we call H. So if we did this for different metals, this whole this line here, would the, the gradient would stay the same, but it would shift uh, in the horizontal direction for different metals. So this photoelectric effect, uh, um, only for certain wavelengths do we see this effect, okay? So uh, we can describe this using this uh, quantum physics uh, idea. So quanta of light, small discrete packets of light, um, and we call these photons. 
So we can think about a series of photons uh, with different energy. And I'm going to talk about these as if they're kind of Christmas presents. Right? So Christmas presents are packets containing a certain amount, of, certain amount of, of stuff. So the size here doesn't actually indicate the physical size, it just indicates the uh, energy. So right here we have small packets for the infrared photons, and they get bigger as we go through the visible spectrum, uh, and they're biggest for this UV uh, photons. Okay, so wavelength in, uh, increases to the right, so red has a long wavelength, blue has a short wavelength. Uh, frequency goes the other way, so the UV photons have a high frequency, and the infrared phot photons have a, a low frequency. And this is the same as energy, so UV photons contain a lot of energy, and infrared photons contain not much energy. Okay, so lo low energy, low frequency, long wavelength on the right-hand side, this red side, and on the blue side, we have high energy, high frequency, and short wavelength. So uh, we can think about uh, light then, light propagates uh, like, like so. So this is a laser, for example. So we have a single wavelength, um, so a single color, we've, we've got red here. And we can think about this red light as being made up of lots of these uh, photons, these small packets of a certain amount of energy. Okay. So the total energy of this beam is, is uh, consists of lots of these small photons. Um, so that was one example. We could increase the intensity of this light, so it's more intense. And what this means is uh, there's just more of these photons. The individual photons have the same amount of energy, but the total energy in the beam of light uh, depends on the number of photons. We can go the other way. We can decrease the intensity so we can make the light really faint. And again, we see the photons have the same energy, but they're less, the beam has a lower density of photons. It's the intensity, it's just the number of photons, uh, it's the color that uh, is dependent on the uh, energy of the individual photons. So we can look at different colors, and we see yellow light, for example, will be made of photons that have an individual energy that's larger. So these photons, I've drawn them bigger, that's just to indicate there they have more energy. Okay, so remember the, the size of the Christmas present here in this analogy doesn't indicate actual physical size, it indicates how much energy uh, each photon has. So the green light is made of uh, photons with more energy. But again, we could increase the intensity and we just have more photons or decrease the intensity, we'd have fewer photons. And just to kind of complete the picture here, blue lights would be uh, even bigger. Okay. So going back to our experimental results, remember we, for this photoelectric effect, we, we required a certain uh, frequency or energy or color of photon to see the effect. So. If we think about this x-axis as being the energy of the photons, we require um, a certain energy of photon to, uh, to begin this effect. If our photons are low energy, then each individual photon doesn't have enough energy to cause this uh, photoelectric effect. So uh, the moral of the story then is that when light interacts with matter, it's the energy of the individual photons that matter, no pun intended. Uh, not the number of photons. Okay, so the total energy isn't important, it's the energy of each individual photon inside this uh, light. So going back to the analogy with the Christmas presents, this is a bit like, um, well, it's gonna depend on who you talk to, but uh, maybe think of a low energy present as being uh, socks. And at least for me, when I was a child, a high energy present was a uh, Lego pirate ship. Okay, and believe me, um, no amount of low energy photons or no amount of socks can uh, make up for a high energy present or a, a Lego pirate ship. Okay, so that's the first question. What does quantum mean? Well, quantum means uh, a small packet of something. Usually we talk about quantum of energy. So energy comes in discrete uh, uh, quantities. Okay, so where energy is exchanged, it's exchanged in a small packets. 
a bit like Christmas presents. So the next question then was, uh, how does Santa uh, fit down the chimney? So to answer this question, we're going to have to take a bit of a, a long path to get there. Um, and then we'll come back and actually answer this question a bit more explicitly. Um, but to answer this question, we have to kind of really go into quantum physics. So quantum physics is not just uh, discrete quantities of energy. There's a lot more to quantum physics and quantum mechanics than this. So uh, you may have heard of something called wave particle duality. So this is our starting point for our second question. And so we've just kind of seen that light, which we traditionally thought of as waves, uh, can display particle-like properties. So, for example, the photoelectric effect could only be explained if we thought about light as being particle-like. This begs the question uh, whether particles um, can display wave-like properties. So light, which we thought of as waves, can display particle-like properties. Can things that we originally thought of as particles, such as electrons, display wave-like properties? So this uh, question was posed by a physicist called Louis de Broglie, and he came up with this very simple equation for the wavelength of a particle. So this is known as the de Broglie wavelength of a particle, this wavelength with the symbol B for de, uh, de Broglie. And this is just equal to H, which is this Planck's constant, which remember was the gradient of that data we saw for the photoelectric effect. And that's divided by the momentum of the particle. Okay, so it was posed that we can really think about particles when they're kind of traveling uh, as traveling like waves. So is there any experimental evidence for this? Well, uh, yes, there is. So if we uh, kind of direct uh, a beam of electrons towards a double slit, so here we have a brick wall with two slits in. Um, so obviously this is a bit of, bit of a cartoon, but these will be very narrow slits. We've drawn our electrons here as little packets. So we're used to thinking about electrons as little packets of mass. If we shine a, a beam of electrons at this double slit, uh, what do we expect to see? Well, if electrons really are particles, then we would expect uh, perhaps uh, something like this. So we can think about these as little tennis balls. If you have two holes in a wall and you hit the tennis balls or the wall, um, they would only go through uh, if their direction was kind of allowed them to go through these slits. Okay, so we don't expect to see peaks. We would expect to see peaks uh, centered at each slit. So if you have two slits, we'd expect to see two peaks. Okay, they're not perfectly thin lines because uh, there may be some slight deviation from uh, parallel. You know, we might have some uh, balls coming in this direction rather than just uh, parallel to the slit direction. So the peaks actually have some uh, some width. And you may have some uh, um, crossover in the middle here. So that's what we'd expect if, if electrons really were particles. Um, but what if electrons were waves? Well, you've probably seen, if you drop kind of pebbles in the water, you see these spherical waves. And uh, if you drop two pebbles in the water, you see the interference between the waves. So this is what we expect for light or for water. Um, and the question is, do we see this for electrons? So uh, if, we, if we look at this for a double slit, we'd see these spherical wave patterns. And uh, Huygens principle tells us that each slit will then act as a new uh, source of spherical waves. And hopefully you can see at the points, certain points, these waves uh, kind of overlap. And here you would get constructive interference and you'd get a high amplitude. And in between, you'd get a low amplitude. So what we see for light, if we shine light at a double slit, we get some interference pattern, okay? Due to the interference between the spherical wave source from each of the two slits. And it looks something like this. So the question is then, what do we see for electrons? Do we see this double peak that we expect for particle-like uh, objects? Or do we see this interference pattern, uh, which we expect for wave-like uh, uh, objects. Okay, so the answer is uh, that we see the interference pattern. Okay, so when we fire electrons, which we think we used to think as particles, uh, through a double split, we actually see uh, an interference pattern. So we actually do this experiment with our second year students here at Lincoln. We do an electron diffraction experiment where they direct an electron beam through a graphite crystal, 
and they see the interference pattern. And from the interference pattern, they can calculate the lattice spacing of the graphite. So this really is a measurable uh, effect. Um, but perhaps uh, maybe you're thinking this is just some statistical effect. Maybe these electrons, after they pass through the slits, they're maybe colliding. And it just so happens that the, there's some sort of uh, statistics and they just happen to make this pattern. So what people have done is actually do this one electron at a time. So when we fire these electrons at this double slit uh, one at a time, so that there's no electron-electron interactions, there's no collision between electrons because there's only one electron going at a time, then we start to see this uh, pattern. So maybe you can convince yourself there's a pattern here, um, but it looks very random. As we keep doing this over and over again, and we build up this uh, uh, electron collisions on this screen. So this is the screen here, which we're seeing. Sorry. If we keep doing this, uh, then eventually we do see this uh, interference pattern, this, these uh, kind of fringes of, of high amplitude and low amplitude. Okay. And this tells us that even when we pass one electron through the slits at a time, we still get this signature of wave-like properties. So even single electrons uh, interact with the slits as if they are a wave, which is uh, really uh, counterintuitive. So how do we kind of uh, put this together? How, how has physics dealt with this problem? Okay. So uh, if we go back to classical physics and think about how we treat particles, so in classical physics, we have a particle, we treat it as, as an actual point mass. So in classical physics, particles are mathematical points, um, but we draw them much bigger so that we can actually see them. So in classical physics, these particles really are kind of uh, packets, uh, Christmas presents. And we define some uh, kind of coordinate system. So here I'm just missing us to one dimensions. So we define uh, some direction x, uh, we define some origin, and we can measure distance from the origin of that particle. And that will tell us the definite position of where that particle is. So here that's x. And it's a function of time because it can change in time. So the position changes and uh, it's described exactly by this uh, dynamical variable x. So that's its coordinate. And we can use Newton's law. This is Newton's second law. So given some force, uh, what's the acceleration that we get because of that force? And that we, uh, from this equation, we can uh, calculate the definite position of this particle. If we know the force and we know the mass, we can calculate the acceleration. Uh, from there, we can uh, calculate the exact position of some particle. In quantum mechanics, we take a slightly different approach. We define some quantity, um, some function, which we call uh, psi, this Greek letter psi. And instead of thinking about this particle as having a, a definite exact position, we think about some distribution of possibilities. Okay, so uh, rather than this particle being at an exact position, it has some distribution of possibilities. So this uh, function is what we call the wave function. Let's uh, right. do this again. So this psi is what we call the wave function. And in order to explain what the wave function is, I'm going to just recap in case you are not familiar um, what a function is. So a function is a mathematical object that takes some input. So for example, we could input some variable x, which could be a position. And we do this mathematical operation and we get some output y. So we can draw this function as a line. So here we have x, our input variable on the horizontal axis. We have our output variable y, on the vertical axis. And this function is called y equals f of x. Okay, so what we're doing is we're just taking some input so say x1, and this function tells us what the output will be. So we input some variable x1, and we have some output y1. 
So that's what a function does. It takes some input, and in mathematics, we say it maps it to some output y. So going back to the wave function then, the input will be some position, for example. So we say we're going to look at the value of the wave function at this position here. And the output will be some uh, number c. So the output is some number c. So this curve is uh, the wave function. But what is this output? So that's the main question is, what is the output of this wave function? Well, it's what we call a probability amplitude. So this number C is what we call a probability amplitude. And the reason this probability amplitude is important is because if we square this probability amplitude, it tells us the probability of finding the particle at this position. So for this example I've drawn here, x1, the value of c at x1, so c1, is uh, uh, maximum, right? So it's high. So this is the most likely position to find this particle. But if we took an x value down here, say, uh, then this c value would be quite small. And that means the probability of finding the particle over here is much, much smaller. So this is what the wave function does. It contains all the information about the probabilities of finding the particle at any given position. Okay, so I showed you Newton's law earlier. And the way we kind of describe the evolution of a system in quantum mechanics, rather than using Newton's law to calculate exactly the definite position of where the particle will be at some time later, given some applied force, in the Schrodinger equation, we have this wave function here, and we look at how the wave function changes in time. So if we can calculate our wave function for a future time, we can calculate the kind of new probability of finding the particle at some position. So it's a wave function that changes over time. The important thing is that quantum mechanics is inherently probabilistic. So this is why a lot of people say that quantum mechanics is weird, is inherently probabilistic. Okay, so that's a bit of background. We've talked about a, a wave function. It's a function that contains information about the probabilities of finding the particle at some given position. Um, but what, does, what has this got to do with uh, Santa Claus fitting down the chimney? Well, the answer uh, is quantum tunneling. So if we uh, treat Santa as a classical Santa, so this is not a quantum Santa, this is a classical Santa, then he has a definite position and a definite size. And unfortunately, this size is too big to fit down this narrow chimney. So classical Santa cannot get down the chimney uh, to deliver the present. But quantum Santa, because his position is described by this wave function, we can treat Santa, instead of treating Santa like a, a particle, we can treat Santa like a wave, and he can display wave-like properties. And that means he can tunnel through the chimney. So I don't have time uh, to really talk in too much detail about the mathematics on, uh, behind tooling. We actually would teach this maybe in third year or even fourth year in a physics program. Um, but I can show you a nice animation. So I've just really taken this from Wikipedia. So you can find this on Wikipedia. And here we see a wave function of a particle. We can think about this as the wave function describing Santa's position. Don't worry about the difference between real and uh, imaginary lines here. Just think about this as some kind of look at the whole thing, this is the position of Santa. And this barrier here, this green kind of hurdle, is uh, the chimney. So this uh, horizontal line is kind of Santa going towards the chimney, and uh, if we watch the animation, we can see Santa can tunnel through the chimney. So there's some small probability, okay, the wave function uh, to the right-hand side of the chimney after uh, the kind of uh, collision, if you like, is not zero. So there's some uh, probability amplitude to the right -hand side of the, of, the, of the barrier. So uh, if Santa is a quantum Santa and he can tunnel through barriers, this can explain why he can uh, get through the narrow chimney. So quantum tunneling is uh, very much observable. So it's similar to a classical effect called um, evanescent waves. So maybe you've done this at school. Uh, there's such a thing as evanescent waves. You can go and look this up. Uh, it's very similar. And the kind of interesting thing here is that this 
uh, is a wave function. It's not an actual physical wave, at least and some people claim it's not. Some people actually claim that it's a physical thing. And we see this same effect with a quantum wave function as we see with a classical uh, light wave. So quantum tunneling um, can happen. Uh, I'm going to show you some actual real world examples in a moment. And um, the point is that it decays exponentially. So the probability of tunneling decays exponentially with increasing chimney length or increasing barrier thickness. So this really does only happen in the real world on very small scales. And um, so it's a bit of an analogy, um, but perhaps this is how Santa uh, gets to the truth. So quantum tunneling is a real thing. We do uh, actually observe this. So uh, for example, alpha radiation, where we have some radium nucleus can emit uh, or radiate a alpha particle uh, to give a radon uh, nucleus. And in order to do this, uh, this alpha particle has to tunnel through a barrier. So this, uh, the alpha particle here can exist very comfortably inside this uh, nucleus, the radon nucleus, um, due to the strong nuclear interactions. Um, but in order to escape, it has to get through this barrier. And this barrier is there because of the uh, elect electros, uh, kind of Coulomb uh, interactions. So the positive helium, uh, the positive alpha particle that will be repelled by the ra radon. Okay, so the barrier it has to get through and it can tunnel through this barrier. So we cannot explain alpha radiation using classical physics. We really do need this idea of quantum tunneling in order to explain this. This is also used, this, this kind of uh, phenomenon of quantum tunneling is also used in a technique called scanning tunneling microscopy. So it's a similar idea. We have some uh, sample here and we have some metal tip. And the idea is that electrons from the sample can tunnel through a gap, uh, a very small gap between the surface and the tip. And the kind of amplitude of this uh, tunneling process uh, depends on the thickness of this barrier, this gap between the sample and the tip. So if we can plot this current uh, that we get, uh, that, we, that we see when electrons tunnel into the tip, then we kind of map out the uh, the surface of the sample. So you see this picture here, kind of looks very much like this if you flip it on its side. And finally, the kind of state of the art transistors are single electron transistors, and they are they kind of rely on tunneling of single electrons through this wire. So this wire here, you can see that it goes basically down the middle of the picture is about 50 nanometers thick. So that's uh, around a thousand times thinner than one of your uh, hairs off the top of your head. Okay, so this is very, very small scale. So we do see quantum tunneling and we have technology that relies on quantum tunneling. So it's a very real effect. And perhaps this is how Santa uh, fits down the chimney. So the last question, oh, actually I forgot about this. Um, I just wanted to say uh, why you shouldn't wait up to see Santa. So Santa fits down the chimney because of tunneling, and uh, there's a reason why you shouldn't wait up uh, to try and catch him. So I showed you this slide earlier. We have some electrons going through a double slit, and on the other side we saw uh, the interference pattern. When we looked at the screen, we saw this interference pattern. Um, but there's a uh, kind of uh, caveat here. Uh, if we instead and measure which slit the particles pass through. So somehow we have a detector uh, on each slit and we can tell uh, precisely which slit the electrons go through. Then if we do that first and then view the screen, we see the classical uh, particle picture. So we see these electrons go through uh, and we see these two peaks. So measurement, so if we measure the electrons going through the slits, then that affects what we see on the screen, which is uh, quite strange. And this is something called a measurement problem. So the fact uh, our choice of the when and how to measure a system actually affects uh, what it does. So this is kind of, um, I wouldn't say controversial as such, but there's many, many different interpretations on how to interpret this uh, measurement problem, where uh, the act of measuring a system actually influences what it does. So here's a list of all the uh, different interpretations. So the one that's usually taught in university, the one I'm kind of 
uh, probably kind of theming my talk in terms of is this Copenhagen interpretation, but there's many more, uh, more than I've even listed here. So just to kind of say, uh, you know, to be open, uh, there is many, many different ways of interpreting quantum mechanics. Experimentally, they, all these different interpretations are the same, but in terms of the uh, metaphysics and the understanding and the underlying theory, they can change uh, slightly. So anyway, back to Stanter. So I've just kind of explained the process of measurement can modify the states of a quantum system and its subsequent evolution. And um, this paper here was done on what's called uh, gas. And they found that uh, measuring the system in a certain way uh, caused a suppression of tunneling. So uh, measurement induced localization causes suppression of tunneling. So what this means is if you uh, stay up and uh, try and watch Santa uh, tunnel to the chimney, it's not gonna happen. So this is kind of the colloquial way of saying this is a watched kettle never boils. This is called a quantum zeno. So this, uh, if you try and uh, measure Santa by watching him uh, before he tunnels through the chimney, uh, by doing so, you can actually prevent him being able to tunnel through the chimney. Okay, so staying up to watch, try and catch Santa uh, come in and deliver the presents will actually prevent him from doing so. So this is why you never see Santa uh, delivering presents. Okay, so uh, the last question, I've got five or 10 minutes left, is uh, how does Santa Claus know who is naughty and who is not? So uh, we've talked about uh, continuous uh, variables. So position, we talked about the wave function, that describes the kind of probability distribution of positions. And position is a continuous variable. We can take any position we like and it will have some probability. But we can do the same kind of stuff for uh, discrete uh, systems. So for example, a coin can be heads or tails. So they're two discrete outcomes. Uh, a die can have uh, six possible outcomes, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we can talk about a wave function in terms of a wave function for these discrete systems too. So uh, let's think about a child as a discrete system with two possible outcomes. So if we were to model the behavioral states of a child as if they were a quantum child, uh, we might decide to use two distinct uh, states, so naughty and nice. So these are mutually exclusive. So a child can only ever act in a naughty way or a nice way. So we can think about these two possibilities as uh, orthogonal directions. So this word orthogonal means uh, at right angles. So they're kind of independent directions. So one direction here, I've written the vertical direction is naughty and the horizontal direction is nice. So don't worry about this line and this arrow. This is just a way to, uh, this is just some notation we tend to use in quantum physics. So this is uh, the naughty direction and this is the nice direction. And can describe an actual uh, child as being some kind of uh, some sort of combination of the two. Like, so we would call this in, 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 in physics or mathematics even a superposition. So for example, we could have some direction in between naughty and nice, say this yellow direction, which is more naughty than nice. So if we kind of draw a line to the horizontal axis, we see it's quite low on the nice scale, uh, but it's quite high on the naughty scale. If we have some uh, kind of uh, direction halfway between naughty and nice, then this is equally naughty and nice. And if we uh, have uh, a direction like this, which is closer to the nice direction, then this is more naughty than nice. So we can describe some child uh, as some superposition between naughty and nice. But a child can only ever be a child can only ever be uh, observed in the naughty state or the nice state. Okay, so before we observe or measure the child, they can exist in some mathematical combination called a superposition uh, between naughty and nice. But when we measure them, um, we only ever see them naughty or nice. So we write this wave function. So we saw this Greek letter psi for the wave function earlier. And this is some combination of naughty and nice. So remember we had these coefficients, these probability amplitudes. So C1 tells us how naughty the child is, and C2 tells us how nice the child is. 
Okay, and the square of these numbers uh, are the probabilities of measuring the child to be in the naughty or nice state. So because these are probabilities, they have to add up to one. But when we measure, so when Santa checks his list, when he measures the child, he only sees them as being naughty uh, or nice. So this should maybe remind you, uh, or maybe it reminds you of um, uh, other things. So you might ask, uh, is it a bit kind of um, uh, accurate to use this kind of language of quantum physics to describe things that aren't kind of at the atomic scale? So usually when you think of quantum physics, you think of super small things. Um, and the answer is uh, maybe not. So there's some work nowadays going on uh, to treat this idea of quantum uh, probability as a kind of super concept where uh, it's applied in areas outside of physics. So, for example, people, psychologists, trying to model uh, how our brains deal with um, optical illusions using the language, the mathematical formalism of quantum probabilities. So here the image could be a duck or a rabbit. Maybe you've seen this before. Um, and uh, people are now trying to describe how our brains uh, observe these uh, kind of bistable stimuli using uh, the language of quantum physics. And we had a student kind of trying to do this with uh, something like this. So this is called a Lita Zhu curve. And uh, maybe uh, this will work, but sometimes you see this rotating clockwise and sometimes you see it rotating anti-clockwise. And we can describe the kind of flips between those two things using uh, the quantum Zeno effects, which come up uh, slightly earlier. So quantum physics really is starting to uh, be used, or at least not quantum physics, quantum probability, the theory, the quantum probability theory, is finding a home outside of physics. And so maybe it's not too much of a stretch to explain uh, Santa Claus using uh, quantum probability. So as I kind of uh, almost started to say, maybe this reminds you of something else. So maybe this reminds you of Schrodinger's cat. So there's a famous thought experiment from Schrodinger who uh, was not so happy with this idea of things um, existing in superposition. So some people claim this superposition is just a reflection of our ignorance about what's going on. And some people claim that this superposition is actually a physical state that the object is in before we measure it. So this is still a controversial issue. And, and Schrodinger developed his famous thought experiment to try and convince people that it's a bit silly to think about the superposition as being an actual physical thing. So uh, many people have heard of this uh, thought experiment, but in case you haven't, I'll just quickly explain what it is. So we have a cat in a box. And as well as the cat being in the box, we have some radioactive sauce. Um, and if this radioactive source were to decay, so that happens random times, then it would trigger some switch, which would break some poison uh, dial, and the cat, unfortunately, would uh, go to sleep. Um, or uh, it's posed usually as dying, um, unfortunately. Um, so if we kind of set up this uh, experiment and close the box, then we don't know whether or not the radioactive source has decayed. So we don't know whether the uh, poison has been released. Um, so according to the observer who's outside of the box, then the cat is in a superposition of alive and dead because uh, we don't know um, whether the poison has been released. As soon as we open the box, then we can see, obviously, if the cat is alive or dead. We don't see the superposition. So this is Schrodinger's point is um, it's kind of very counterintuitive to think about a cat as being alive and dead at the same time. So what does this actually mean, the superposition of a cat being alive and dead? Does it mean both dead and alive? So before we open the box and look at the cat, is the cat dead and alive at the same time? Or is the cat neither dead nor alive? So is it alive and dead or neither dead nor alive? So just to kind of finish off, I wanted to just mention something called the logic of the catascotti. So uh, I think this is from the ancient Buddhist tradition. And it's to do with the possibilities of logic. So our Western logic is, is pretty much based on two possibilities. A statement A, A could be something like, for example, uh, the cat is dead or it's, it's raining. 
Um, a could be true or A could be false. So we write this as A is true, we just write A. Uh, a is false, we'd write uh, not A. So the symbol here means not. So either A or not A. A is true or A is false. So this is the kind of logic we're used to in, in Western society, Western culture. Um, but there are other possibilities. So there is actual logical frameworks where we have these uh, to us that may sound strange possibilities. So A is true and false at the same time. And A is neither true nor false. So there are logical uh, frameworks out there that have these uh, seemingly strange um, possibilities for statements to be true and false at the same time, or neither true nor false. So perhaps the reason quantum physics seems so strange to us is just um, a bias because uh, we're so used to dealing with these two uh, extremes of logic, two, ex two kind of uh, opposite cases, true and false. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully we have some time for questions. I'll close my screen now. So it seems there's no questions, uh, but that's okay. Um, so, okay, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you do have questions, um, please do just type them in the in the video. I'll try and kind of check every result and, and I'll try and answer in the comments on YouTube. So thank you for your, for your time and have a good day.